Because of the following CBS News special report, the Merv Griffin Show will begin at 12 o'clock, 11 central time tonight. Some 300 persons and three expensive airliners of three nations are waiting now on a desert airstrip in Jordan, waiting for the world's diplomats to find the answer to a Middle East crisis of frightening dimension, waiting in the sweltering heat of a metal aircraft under a broiling sun, hostages of the 20th century equivalent of the Barbary pirate. We simply can't tolerate the situation. You can't go on endlessly like this. Uh, we've been so fortunate in not, in not having complete disasters, the one where the aircraft was blown up in the air, but there could have been any number of other ones. We just, uh, it just, from a technical, from a pilot's viewpoint, we just figure that sooner or later there's going to be, if this continues, there's going to be worse disasters. Don't you feel that your own policy of violence is moving you into a dead end from which you will not be able to escape and move to a policy of peaceful accommodation? What do we have to lose if it happens? All we have left as Palestinians is the better tense that has been given to us by countries which give our adversary, our enemy, the phantoms and the napalm to burn the tents and to burn our people. Good evening. Just a few hours ago, the deadline set by the guerrillas for the release of their terrorist comrades expired. But instead of blowing up their captive planes and passengers, they announced an indefinite extension of their automaton. However, there is still great concern tonight about the fate of some 300 passengers and crew aboard those three hijacked planes. This is a CBS News special report, The Hijack Conspiracy with CBS News correspondent Walter Cronkite, sponsored by... Western Electric, the people who make Bell telephones and the communications equipment of the future. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. To my brother Jesse and the L. Safe, motherfucker. I'm a brother Jack. Kelly Jack. Kane. To a Jack. Hey, hello, Stow, Rackin' the Star. What's up, Jack? Yeah, no doubt, Green Eyes, one love. PLO style, Buddha monks with the owl, PLO style, Buddha monks with the owl, PLO style, Buddha monks with the owl, PLO style, style, style. Here come the ruckus, the motherfucking ruckus Thousands of cutthroats and crumb snatching fuckers Straight from the rain, I be giving you the pain Anger, coming from the 36 chamber Bang, the cow, hitting with the Buddha fist style Shotgun, slamming in your chest, piece plow Frame, gets blown all over the terrain Like a man without no arms, you can't hang Time for a change of the guard You've been arrested for lyric fraud, now you are For real, check it, I pull strings like BB King on guitar I'm the true fist of the North Star. Oh, what a tangle web we weave When first we practice to deceive Guns be clinking, running with my clan We be sticking, whatever My sweet family stays together Represent what I am meant Kill a hill resident, rest in peace to my nigga two cent The street life is the only life I know I live by the cold style, it's mad PLO Iranian thoughts are covered like an Arabian Grab the nigga who on the spot and put a nod to his cranium Get no satisfaction, niggas won't be lasting long Unless they get protection, for real Strong, coming with my clan, so what's happening? Commercial rap, hate it with the past M-E-T-H-O-D, got me drinking O-D all night in the MPV, just maxing. Looking for hoes, you know, relaxing. Bitches know the hour, it be time for some action. PLO, peace to that nigga Berriano. What up, bitch? Take him to the bridge. PLO style, Buddha monks with the owl. 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 PLO style, style. situation as of this moment. There now are three jetliners, a TWA, a Swiss airliner, a British overseas plane on that airstrip in the Jordanian desert 30 miles from Amman. Arab guerrillas hold as captive some 300 nationals from the United States, Britain, West Germany, Switzerland, Israel, even now from some Arab lands. 
But the guerrillas have extended the deadline for the expiration of their ultimatum for the release of their fellow terrorists, giving the International Red Cross an opportunity to negotiate for the release of the plane's hostages. Washington has been a major center of activity of these efforts, and we have a report on developments there from Dan Rather. The situation is fragile, but not desperate. That, in summary, appears to be the White House view. Hope has been rekindled by the fact that the terrorists let their deadline tonight pass and no new deadline has been set. What induced the kidnappers not to make good on their deadline threat, no one here is willing to discuss. Since mid-afternoon, however, there has been much talk in upper reaches of the Nixon administration about giving in to any reasonable guerrilla demands that would free the hostages. The president spent much of the early part of the day reviewing all alternatives. These included military options and some contingency military plans were made. Mr. Nixon was told, however, that there were few, if any, military options that didn't run high risk to the lives of hostages. The Central Intelligence Agency emphasized that the terrorists are desperate, determined fanatics willing to destroy themselves and hostages if panicked by anything at all. With this in mind, the president, through intermediaries, consulted with the British about releasing the Palestinian woman skyjacker held in London. Six C-130 prop jet transport planes were moved into Turkey on a strictly standby basis for possible use in evacuation if a deal could be arranged. Elements of the U.S. 6th Fleet in the Mediterranean were moved closer to Jordan. The U.S. Army's 8th Infantry Division in Germany, which includes two paratroop battalions, was reported by some sources to be on tentative alert. This was not officially confirmed. No U.S. military involvement other than possible evacuation operations seems to be seriously contemplated unless, as one source said, there is some disaster out there in the desert. Dan Rather, CBS News, the White House. Part of your telephone will fill this whole room. It's called the Telephone Central Office. And the men who put it together for your Bell Telephone Company are Western Electric installers. It has hundreds of thousands of parts, but it's as much a part of your telephone as your dial. It's the part that searches out, finds, and connects you with the number you're dialing, usually in seconds. It's one of the most complex machines ever developed. Putting it together is one of the most complex jobs in the Bell system. And the highly skilled, carefully trained installers who do the job test and retest every step of the way to make sure that each step has been done properly that every one of the millions of connections is exactly right. Western Electric, we make Bell Telephone equipment, the big part you don't see, and the small part you do see every day. Palestinian guerrillas, in a bold, coordinated action, created this newest crisis Sunday. And in so doing, they accomplished what they set out to do. They thrust back into the world's attention a problem diplomats have tended to shunt aside in hesitant steps toward Middle East peace, yet a problem demanding solution if there is to be peace. The problem of the Arabs, displaced by the creation of the State of Israel 22 years ago, a creation in which the United States was instrumental. While the world worried about the shaky ceasefire between Israel and Egypt and Jordan, guerrilla hijacked teams struck four airlines almost simultaneously. Three attacks succeeded. But Israeli security forces and crew members overwhelmed the team aboard an El Al flight killing an Arab man and capturing his female companion, a veteran hijacker. The successful teams forced two planes, Swiss Air and Transworld Airlines, to an airstrip which had been carved into the desert near Amman, Jordan, where they were joined today by that British plane. There they wait tonight, ringed by guerrilla tanks and armor, and in turn, ringed by Jordanian army forces, each fearful of the first move. The fourth attack Sunday involved a Pan-American 747 jumbo jet, the hijackers took it first to Beirut and then to Cairo. Even before it landed, they ignited the fuse to explosives placed throughout the plane. Passengers and crew members had only minutes to scramble free before the $23 million aircraft went up in flames. The Pan Am passengers went free, but the Swiss Air and CWA passengers went to the desert, innocent human pawns in an international power struggle. The guerrillas checked passports and religion and let some 125 go on to Amman. But the remaining 190 became hostages for seven Arabs held by Switzerland, West Germany, and Britain. The hostages have been allowed limited movement, a chance to talk with the Red Cross, and access to a doctor. Food has been adequate, sanitation inadequate, and the sun has been broiling on the metal skin of those jets. 
Then the guerrilla hijackers struck again. The British Overseas Airways Corporation jet with 113 persons aboard, taken over the Persian Gulf and ordered to Beirut, where these photographs were taken. It too then was flown to that Jordanian desert strip called Dawson Field. There's a report tonight that the guerrillas now have provided their captives with portable air conditioning units and four crates of whiskey. That would help. Through all this, a key figure is one Andre Rochat. As Marvin Kalb reports, what happens now in great part rests with the diplomatic skill of this quiet, unassuming Swiss official. Rochat is the principal negotiator sent by the International Red Cross to deal with the guerrillas in Jordan. He knows the key commandos. He's dealt with them before in other hijackings. It was Rochat who procured the deadline delay. And now in a few hours, he's to meet with the guerrillas to discuss release of the hostages. Calb understands that one problem is the absence of guerrilla leader George Habash. He's in North Korea. The other major problem is Israel. The guerrillas apparently will ask for release of thousands of their Palestinian prisoners. The Israelis up to now have insisted they will not negotiate with what they consider bandit criminals. But Calb says there are indications that under pressure from Washington, they may yield on this point. The hijackings have triggered a shockwave of indignation and concern throughout the world. Even Nasser's Egypt has denounced the air piracy, charging that it will lose whatever support there is for the cause of the Palestinian refugees. But the Arab commandos say they're not concerned about world opinion, that their hijackings are a legitimate instrument of war against the Israelis. One of their spokesmen in the United States discussed his view of the situation with our UN correspondent, Richard C. Hoffman. Mr. Hassan, what is the purpose of these hijackings? Well, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, which was responsible for this hijacking, feels uh, that these instrumentalities of the Palestinian Revolution are capable of directing world public opinion to the tragedy that befell the people of Palestine ever since the creation of the State of Israel and the eviction of those people from their homes and homeland. Two, I believe that they feel that this was also an, the answer of the Palestinian people to the big power attempt to impose a solution with regard to the question of Palestine, which is unacceptable to the people of Palestine and then to which the people of Palestine were not consulted. And this is their answer to it. But a great deal of world opinion has really turned against you and is labeling Palestine, Palestinians now as terrorists, even Egypt, which uh, certainly has not uh, sought to appease Israel and has carried on its struggle, has turned against you and has condemned or at least disapproved of these uh, well, hijackings. Well, public opinion was party to the tragedy that was forced upon the people of Palestine when 23 years ago the United Nations succumbed to the pressure of the government of the United States when it decided to partition Palestine and to create the State of Israel. That resulted in the creation of the atmosphere, of the climate, which is conducive for Palestinian young men and women who were either ejected when they were children or, he were, or who were born in, the, uh, in their tents and their refugee camps to become uh, desperate, to become uh, commanders, to become aware that the world understands only one language, and, known, and namely that of force. If you watch carefully and listen, the body will tell you how much effort it takes to perform a job. This is part of a new science at Western Electric called biomechanics, the science of man and machine. The people of Western Electric, in cooperation with Texas Tech and the University of Michigan, have pioneered studies in biomechanics. We believe it's better to change jobs to fit people than people to fit jobs. So, we're redesigning chairs, workbenches, and assembly lines we use to make equipment for the Bell Telephone Network. We've even listened to an arm talk and tell us how a basic hand tool can be changed to make people more comfortable at their work. Western Electric. We make Bell Telephones with people and machines that are made for each other. At the United Nations, the 15-nation Security Council met at the urgent request of the United States and Britain, and it appealed to the guerrillas to release all their hostages. Here again is Richard C. Hopley. The action this afternoon was mostly behind the scenes. For three hours, key members argued in the President's office over what the appeal should say and how to say it quickly. 
The solution was to permit no debate. This set the stage for the president, Ambassador Davidson Nicole of Sierra Leone, to address the council. I know that important principles are involved which cannot be solved in a day's debate. But I know that I speak for many when I appeal to those concerned to spare the lives of innocent men, women, and children not involved in a state of war and who are traveling in the peaceful pursuit of their private lives and existence. We do not intend to solve the problems of this area of the Middle East this afternoon. We recognize that there have been many past wrongs in this area. We are all anxious that they should be corrected. We would like to appeal that more immediately today, those passengers and crews, and when I say passengers, I mean all passengers on board aircraft who have purchased tickets and are in the aeroplanes, who have been held as a result of hijackings or interference during uh, international traveling, should be released and allowed to go free and unharmed. The Security Council's appeal was then adopted within minutes by consensus without even a formal vote. All the kinks had been ironed out in advance. The idea was to forestall a debate in which Algeria would have opened the whole Pandora's box of the Middle East problem. Algeria's Mohammed Yazid was here as the spokesman of the Palestine Arabs to state their case. His speech would have drawn an immediate response from Israel's Joseph Tekoa, and the exchange, it was felt, would not speed the release of the people on the plains or improve the chances of the peace talks which are still in suspense here. Now the question is whether the appeal will be effective. The wording was changed in those three hours to cover the release of hijackers as well as hostages, and thereby to help the work of the International Red Cross, which is the only agency dealing directly with the Palestine guerrillas. The Security Council feels it has put into words world public opinion, all it could do. Now it has adjourned and hopes that its effort will help. Richard C. Hottle at CBS News, United Nations. Correspondent Hottle asked the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations about his reaction to that Security Council move. Mr. Ambassador, is Israel satisfied with this appeal? We believe that uh, the resolution adopted by the Security Council today could have been stronger, yet it does contain a clear, unequivocal call for the immediate release of all the passengers and crews that are being detained as a result of the hijackings. It is to be hoped, therefore, that this uh, call would be heeded. You say they should have been stronger, these appeals, uh, in what way? Uh, they could have uh, condemned uh, these acts, terror warfare conducted by uh, the Arab terror organizations against Israel uh, for a number of years. Uh, they could have also called specifically upon the Arab governments to prevent hijackings, not to cooperate with hijacking acts, and to see to it that when hijackings do occur, the passengers and crews detained are released immediately. What effect is it likely to have on the actual situation? Well, it all depends uh, whether or not uh, this call of the Security Council representing the conscience of the world, in a way, uh, would be uh, heeded by the uh, hijackers. I uh, uh, hope that it would be and that this would uh, attenuate the tension that has uh, uh, built up over the last few uh, days as a result of these uh, crimes. If the call of the Security Council is not heeded, I fear that this would create a very dangerous situation in the Middle East. Aerial piracy is not exactly a new phenomenon. The practice began in 1930, but for 37 years it was rare, a half a dozen incidents a year, and the number of passengers affected by the hijackings was small. Then came 1968, and the number soared to 30, 1969 and more than double to 70, and 1970 so far, 43. In all of commercial airline history, there have been 251 attempts. Of them, 188 succeeded and 63 failed. Most of the hijackers who succeeded went to Cuba, 122 of them. But 66 others chose other destinations, many of them Middle Eastern countries. Governments and commercial aviation have struggled to find an answer to the problem. 
and the Middle East hijackings have given new urgency to their efforts. David Schumacher reports from Washington. There's been a string of closed-door meetings here at the Federal Aviation Administration and elsewhere in Washington, with officials trying to develop new plans to frustrate hijackers. One big problem has been to find a way that won't immediately bog down in international relations. It's estimated by airline sources that there are about 2,500 flights around the world each day which could be considered fairly vulnerable to hijackings. Most officials agree that by extending the electronic metal detection system and other checks of boarding passengers, the domestic situation in the United States could be handled. Not all the gates are equipped with the detectors, however, and the airlines are being urged to share the electronic gear until they can be installed everywhere. Domestic hijackings already are down two-thirds compared to last year. International flights pose a more difficult problem, and in recent days, both the pilots and the airlines have come to the conclusion that there's no choice but to install armed guards. In the past, they felt the danger of a mid-air gun battle was too great, but now they say there's not really much chance that an airliner could be knocked out of the sky. CBS News reporter Tony Sargent talked with Transportation Secretary John Volpe about all this. We have been uh, looking at it for many months. There are those who say put armed guards on them, we may have to come to this, and we'll be discussing this again today, but the fact is that you and I know what could happen if there were armed guards. You could have a shootout in the plane and automatically kill all of the passengers on the plane. So it is a very complicated problem. It has been aggravated by the events of the last couple of days, and I think we'll just have to do something more than we've done today. What would you say are the chances of the armed guard solution to this problem being imposed, at least temporarily? Well, if I were a betting man, and I'm not, I would say the chances are quite likely we may have to do it. One source estimates the cost of armed guards for the so-called vulnerable flights at about $3 million a year. There's no agreement whether they would be government agents or private police. And like new extradition agreements, armed guards would require international approval. The pilots are considering both boycotts and strikes to hurry negotiations. David Schumacher, CBS News, Washington. Whatever international solutions are reached, the airlines themselves already are tightening security. David Colhane reports from John F. Kennedy International Airport in New York. Security measures have been stepped up at airports all across the United States. There's been no discernible drop in passenger traffic, but a few anxious souls have called up and demanded an ironclad guarantee that their flight will not be hijacked. Obviously, the airlines are in no position to give such a guarantee. But here at Kennedy Airport in New York and elsewhere in the United States, fairly strict security measures are in effect. This is the key electronic security device, the magnetometer. All passengers walk between these two metal poles before boarding their flight. If they have any gun or metal weapon or any metal object on their person, the magnetometer will detect it and alert officials. Not every flight is checked with the magnetometer, but this week it would be fair to say that it is used with most flights. And the passengers, even in European flights going near the Middle East, are pretty much taking the hijack potential in stride. Excuse me. Were you concerned at all about the possibility of a hijack oh, with this I'm flight? I'm standing on TWA to take care of me. Say again. Pardon me? Say I'm just standing on TWA to take care of me. <laughs> How about you? No, I wasn't concerned. You don't have a one time to die. <laughs> Excuse me. How about you? Were you concerned at all about the possibility of hijack? No, not really. No. Why not? I guess I just travel so much that I don't think too much about those things happening. <laughs> Thank you. The security measures are causing some slow-ups, but these people are delighted to be delayed. If it means that you won't end up in the Jordan Desert, who cares about an extra 15 minutes? David Culhane, CBS News at Kennedy Airport, New York. Governments, airlines, and passengers aren't the only ones worried about hijacking. The big insurance companies are running multi-million dollar risks. That story from Morley Safer in London. Lloyd's of London are among the biggest underwriters of aircraft insurance in the world. This week's epidemic, as they call it at Lloyd's, of aircraft hijacking has caused an extraordinary flurry of activity. In the underwriter's room, brokers clustered around the so-called casualty board that announces missing ships and planes, and just lately, hijacks. They were following the course of the BOAC BC-10 taken by Arab commandos this afternoon. The events of this week have forced the underwriters to re-examine their policies. 
I spoke to the chairman of Lloyd's Aircraft Underwriters, Owen Davis, on the left, and the former chairman, David Barham. Is there hijack insurance as such? There is, there is, there is. Um, and uh, most of the major airlines of the world do insure for this particular eventuality. We've now had four, five attempts and four successful hijacks in just the past few days. Are they forcing the insurance rates up generally for aircraft? Oh, I, I can assure you that at Lloyd's at the moment, there's an awful lot of people uh, running around and looking at their books and seeing what rates they've got and what they think they should have as a result of this recent epidemic of hijack. Is there anything the insurance companies can do? Well, I think that um, really the only thing that we can do is to uh, either refuse to insure them, this is when they come up for renewal, of course, we're on risk now, or put the rates up so high that um, it becomes an un uneconomical proposition for them to insure. Uh, either way, I, I, I think that um, they're bound to uh, have to bring this to a head, whether we put the rates up or whether we don't. This cannot go on, this situation, but that's about all we can do. Tonight at an aviation meeting in Honolulu, the president of the International Air Transport Association said he had been advised that the insurance industry around the world has canceled policies with the airlines because of the hijacking. A statement made by Garrett van der Waal, who is also president of the Dutch KLM airline, stunned those at the meeting. Contacted in the middle of the night in London about this, Lloyd's officials sleepily denied that it has canceled any policy. These are the people who make the things your phone calls are made of. The people of Western Electric, over 200,000 of us. Our job in the Bell system is to make telephones, intricate communications equipment, and millions and millions of things that are needed to connect one phone with another in the world's largest telephone network the Bell Telephone Network. The people of Western Electric. We make Bell Telephone and other things to help you reach just about any place in the country. Now here is Eric Severide in Washington for some thoughts on this frightening episode of air piracy. This is one of those times when government leaders earn their pay. They have got to think their way out of this terrifying phenomenon of mass kidnappings by air. Whatever they try may go wrong, and they know that blame lands at jet speed. They are thinking the hard, short thoughts how to solve this immediate episode. Others are free for the long, long thoughts about what history may be trying to tell us as to man's capacity to survive the technology he has created. Adolf Hitler's chief architect, Albert Speer, had 20 years in Spando prison to brood about this. Hitler was the first tyrant with modern technology at his command. This increased in geometric proportion his capacity to do evil. But there is another side to this coin. It is the capacity of the weak, the obscure, furtive shadows of individuals to do evil, by slipping a grain of sand in technology's interdependent gears. One man with a pistol, toy or reel, can divert a great aircraft and a hundred human beings a thousand miles off course. Ten adolescents can slip through dark alleys throwing Molotov cocktails and pulling fire alarms, tie up the fire and police forces of a great city and produce a holocaust. A political romantic with a stick of dynamite can destroy years of precious research. A slight overload in a power grid can throw millions of homes into darkness. A strike by a one-vote margin can force millions to walk to work or stay home. We now live in and by the web of an enormously complicated, intensely interrelated technology, the whole no greater than its parts and its strongest parts at the mercy of its weakest links. This is a way of life that depends absolutely on order and continuity and predictability. But it happens that we have simultaneously reached a point of discontinuity in the political and social relations of men where little is predictable and disorder spreads. 
the anarchic idea flourishes and the techniques of the guerrilla fighter are widely adopted. Tyrants can do massive things with technology. Individual anarchists or guerrillas can do massive things to it, and thus to us all. The dilemma over the hijacked airplanes is an isolated clinical example of a vaster dilemma. No one sees certain remedy. Everyone senses that the search for remedy through laws, rules, police, prohibitions will be painful. When the need for safety expands, familiar freedoms can only shrivel. This is Eric Severide in Washington. Dawn is just breaking over the Jordanian desert. Dawn of a fourth day for most of those hostages, the second day for the rest. It may be a day of decision for them, but as pawns in this desperate game, a decision so remote from their own hands. This is Walter Cronkite, CBS News. Good night. And this has been a CBS News special report, The Hijack Conspiracy, with CBS News correspondent Walter Cronkite, sponsored by... Western Electric, the people who make Bell telephones, and the communications equipment of the future. This is CBS. The last passengers were evacuated only 15 minutes before the explosion. There were five Israeli girls who were taken by the guerrillas to a secret hiding place along with 35 men. Then the hijackers went to work. They put stacks of dynamite in the three planes and moved back. For the first time in seven days, Liberation Airstrip was utterly silent. The BOAC VC-10 was the first to go. The smoke, flames, and sand obscured the other blasts, but a few seconds later, the American TWA jet went up, then the Swiss Air DC-8. The planes were worth some $30 million. The black clouds could be seen for miles, and a new stage in the darkening political situation had begun. The Jordanian government announced the act, which also exposed the growing rift within the guerrilla ranks. The more moderate Palestine Liberation Organization said it would cease to deal with the Popular Front. In Geneva, the International Red Cross said it was suspending negotiations with the guerrillas. The Israelis announced they had rounded up 450 Arabs from the occupied territories, including close relatives of the guerrilla leader. They did not disclose what they would do with their prisoners, but reliable sources said they'd be used as counter-hostages pending the release of all the hijacked passengers. In London today, 62 people from the BOAC VC-10 received a cold, wet welcome from the English climate. There were about 20 children on board. The flight had been nicknamed the Lollipop Special. Earlier, BOAC had charted in parents and relatives who were considerably more emotional than the youngsters. The 21-year-old steward on the flight described the most harrowing moment of the past few days. The worst moment was when we were leaving. Um, we were on the buses and the planes had been blown when we were surrounded by the Jordanese troops. The whole convoy, so to speak, was surrounded by Jordanese troops who were about to open fire in tanks. At this, the guerrillas who were in the buses and in the jeeps jumped out of, the bus, out of them, took off the safety catches on their guns and put bullets into the, into the chambers and put it into the, the bus and it was at that split second that that happened which was very very quick i almost lost contact with reality of any sort i think these guys mean business they're not bluffing you don't know did any of the passengers uh, react with anger were there any arguments between the passengers and the gorilla no no not at all actually the passengers behaved very well and i would say the Gorillas also behaved very well. They weren't mean and they, weren't, they didn't try to uh, pick fights. They tried to help people. This is my you experience. You were not threatened in any way? No, not Did in any way. Did you any assurance at all at any time that you would be released before you No. Okay, well, Mr. Smith is, is it Tracy? Kind of forced out of here. Is it Tracy? Okay. Lucy? Can get on the Lucy, side. could you tell us what happened when you first knew that the plane had been skyjacked? Well, um, we had to put our hands we had to put our hands behind our head, and we had to sit there, and we spent the night, and it was very hot. Can you tell us exactly uh, what you knew of how the hijacking happened now, Bruce? Um, well, he had a New York ticket, and he came on the plane, and um, I guess he found out that we weren't going to um, Am Amman, and he took us there. He hijacked us there. Who took you in here during the hijacking? Did you I was sleeping. I was sleeping. Who told you to put your hands behind your head? Um, the, someone came over the loudspeaker. Yeah, 
At any time, were there guerrillas on board the plane with weapons? No. Oh, I don't know what to say. It's it's, it's, it's been an experience. It's uh, we had hard times and we had I don't say good times, but sometimes it was easy. Other times it was pretty hard. What well, happened what, to you? Well, we got hijacked over Belgium and we were taken over to the desert, and then we stayed 24 hours in the plane. Then we were taken to the hotel. Uh, at times at the hotel, there was some shooting. The girls got uh, got scared. Well, how difficult was it? You had your child with you. There was shooting. Tell us just how difficult. How hard were the times? You were well, actually, the the hardest was on the children. It wasn't on me. I was kind of scared for them. I had four other girls. I was taking care of them. Uh, my daughter and Miss Smith, she isn't here right now, but she came over with me. There were two more girls. One is named uh, Jean uh, Swanson. She's from uh, uh, from the West Coast. The other is Jane, Jane McBride. She's from Georgia. Somehow we stuck together since we were on one plane. We were on TWA. And uh, again, we stayed in the hotel, and at times we slept all together in one room. Mr. Adasi, did you think at any point that you were not going to get out of this? Yes, I did. Mr. Adasi, what kind of questions were you asked by the guerrillas? We weren't asked any questions. We did they converse with you at all? Yes, at times. They, when we landed, they asked us to give us to give them our passports, which we did, and we filled out almost uh, a duplication of any form when you enter an airport of your nationality and the passport number. Did any of the passengers the display kind of any anger when you arrived? Submit to force. Suppose somebody moves in there with, with the troops and tries to get those hostages away. What do you think will happen? Well, it's up to her. You ask her. Well, what, what did you think of the whole experience? Sugar, move in a little bit closer it to these microphones. It wasn't easy. What, what, were you very frightened about about what was happening? Can you explain to us what happened to you? Well, we were over on the way to California, then they then they took over, and then they said on the microphone that we go to a land with nice people and nice land and. For your own safety, keep your hands behind your neck. Were you frightened? Yes. What else happened after that? Then we, then at the night we landed in the desert. And what did you do during that night? It was hot, fanning. Then what happened? Then we went to bed and we woke up and they gave us some food. What did you do during the day, honey? Play games. What did you ever? Did you ever cry? Did you ever cry when you were there? Once. When did you cry? It's when I thought we were going to get parted. Parted? Uh -huh. No, we were. Some, she thought we might be separated, and she didn't like that. I see. Did they threaten to separate no, you? No, no, because they said they were going to release women and children first, and she thought she might have to leave me, or I leave her, or something. You were never separated from the rest of the no. family at any time? No, no. This is my family. This is my daughter. Mr. Adasi, you, had, you took uh, Ruth Smith in the hand, didn't you? Yes. You helped her out? Uh, I helped her and helped the other two girls, too. And there were two other women. We stayed together. I don't really remember their last names. Uh, excuse me, but uh, Mr. Adasi wants to, Mr. Smith wants to thank Mr. Adasi personally, and Mr. Adasi has to be in an airplane in five minutes, so we're going to try to get thank him back you, inside. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Yvonne. Yvonne. How old are you? How old are you? How old are you? She's eight years old. Yvonne is the first name. What's your name? That's what I mean. Whoops. How many of you were on board? Okay, are you all set now? you have everybody? Yeah. Anything politics or anything at all? No, but they said that they didn't want to hurt us. You were never threatened with physical harm. No. How did they treat you? They fed us. They treat us. Treat us good. What was the worst part of the trip for you, Ruth? No. Um, all of it. Is there anything specific that you remember about this trip, or just the whole thing? Any? Okay. Yeah. I'll never forget it. Yeah. Did you ever feel uneasy about making international flights in the future? Um, not unless my mother and father with me. Yeah. Did you talk to any of the guerrillas? Did they hold conversations no, with uh -uh. you? Time, see any dynamite, any explosives in the area that you were in around the airplanes? No, but in my room at the hotel, we found bullets and all, and everybody had to sleep out in the hall. Did you hear the firing around the hotel? Yes. What happened when that went on? Well, everybody went down in the shelter. 
in this shelter place that they had. And they stayed there until um, we got finished shooting. Were you aware what was going on or who was shooting whom outside? No, I didn't know who, why they were shooting or nothing. Ruthie, were you able to contact your parents while you were there? No. Gentlemen, thank you. Okay. Whoops, oh, let's get a slipper back on. Put the children on the chair and Dear one me. parent on each side. Okay, can we have you stay right here? Roll on this. Roll it, Bernie. Roll it. All the time. Mic stands now. Bill, can you get the beginning of the mic stand there? Yeah, okay, well, that's all. Mic stands. Okay, Doctor, you want to come over here? Just come right over here. How's this? Is this okay for everybody? Well, not for Mrs. Gupta, I'm afraid. Metro Media stand. Metro Media. Get rid of it. How is this? Is this all right? Can you can you pick up any sound from Mrs. Gupta? We can. <laughs> all right, go ahead. Doctor, would you reflect for us on what's happened to you? Well, uh, when our plane uh, took off from Frankfurt, uh, about 10 minutes thereafter, uh, I saw a man um, got up from his seat. Uh, he had a silver gun in his hand, and he just rushed towards the cockpit. And uh, soon thereafter, the people cried, men with a gun. And uh, uh, then one of the employees rushed to catch him, but uh, he was already way ahead to the cockpit. And, and then the uh, pilot, uh, or the captain, he announced that uh, this is the captain is speaking, and. Uh, uh, our plane has been taken over by a Palestinian commando, and uh, we are heading towards a friendly city. Now, he didn't say what friendly city, so we were all in a suspense, uncertain where we are heading to. And uh, this uncertainty kept on our head for the next several hours. We tried to take out our maps and try to figure out where we are heading to, uh, but it was obviously very, very difficult. Tell us about how it was on the ground. Uh, I think our plane touched about uh, 6 o'clock, it was just uh, it was evening when it touched the ground and uh, soon after the lights went out and these people with the guns they moved in and uh, What did they say to you? Well they demanded our passports and they said that uh, you don't worry, you are, we are a friendly people, friendly country and uh, we have our own government whom we are serving. and. Uh, uh, then they collected our passports, gave some forms to fill out, like the uh, embarkation forms uh, on which they had their own government, uh, liberation of Palestine government, whatever it is. Uh, they filled out the forms, then they collected the forms, and uh, then uh, the lights just completely went out and uh, we were left to sleep. Doctor, I mean, will you tell us about your, their, the treatment you received while you were hostage? Uh, you see, the whole environment was uh, different, not very pleasant one. I mean, the fact that you were hijacked there, uh, people with the guns moving around you, you can't get out of the plane. Uh, there was very little water supply, or food supply, the bathrooms, etc. They all became dirty. You can't move much in the, within the limited space, particularly with the kids. I mean, they had very hard time. I mean, they, they, it's very hard to keep them in their seats. I mean. Uh, they just want to move around, and they wouldn't let them move around. What did, you, doctor, what did your doctor, captors do? Doctor, at any time did they explain to you why you were hijacked? Well, yes, they explained that uh, uh, we have our government whom we are serving, and uh, we have some differences with other nations, and that's why we have hijacked the planes. Did they at any time threaten your life? Uh, no, they didn't threaten our life. They said that you will be safe. Uh, but you are hostages and we'll keep you as prisoners. Uh, could, we, could we get your wife? Sure. This is good. How do you feel about it? Well, um, I think we were quite safe. Those people, they said that uh, your lives are quite safe and uh, we are not, to, we're not uh, going to give you any harm. We are not going to shoot you or anything. Sure. 
No, we were afraid. We were scared because there were so many people and they had big guns, you know, in their hands. They won't uh, won't let us move from our seats. So and um, um, I don't know what to say. How do it you was feel? very, you know, it was very cold during night time and it was very hot during daytime. But after 24 hours, Germans, Indians, um, they were taken out of the airplane and uh, we were moved to some hotel. Do you have any reservations about making international flights? I don't think so. Was there a time but, when you um, felt you might not get back? Or were you that frightened? Yes, I think so. You know. Doctor, uh, let me ask you. Do you okay, have I think we have to. That's right. What are the names? Okay. What are your names? Just like you, I was planning to make again the flight to India next year. But uh, I've changed my mind at least for the next three, four years, I'm not going to go. What do you think about this whole frightening thing of hostages and blowing up planes? This should be stopped uh, by any means. Even if I have to be searched before I get into the plane, uh, I'll better stand dead than being hijacked. Okay, Dr. Gupta, right. thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you. What is your husband's first name? Malak. M-A-N-A-K. And what does he do? He's an uh, assistant professor in Buffalo State University of New York. Sure. Professor what kind of what? Professor. 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 Assistant professor. He teaches What's up? finance, business finance. administration. What are the children's names? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you very, very much. Let's go. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Life insurance comes from 60 years' experience advising businessmen. Employers Insurance of Warsaw. We think insurance ought to work for a living. That's the Warsaw story. Some weeks ago, a ragtag band of Middle East revolutionaries hijacked a covey of jet airliners and then, armed only with grenades and rifles, faced down the power of the Western world including the armed might of the United States Sixth Fleet, which was powerless to move against them without jeopardizing the lives of the 350 hostages they were holding. In a world crisscrossed by jet air routes, oil pipelines, and high-tension wires, it has become increasingly easy for virtually anyone to throw a monkey wrench into the works. And these Middle East guerrillas seem to be masters of the art. They are Marxist-Leninists, and they call themselves the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. They are the most militant of the groups dedicated to recapturing their homeland, from which they say they were driven, and the Israelis say they fled. One of the guerrillas is a 26-year-old Palestinian girl named Leila Khaled. In 1969, she successfully hijacked an Athens-bound TWA plane and diverted it to Damascus. This year, she was captured after a gun battle aboard an El Al flight in which her co-hijacker, Patrick Arguello, a Central American, was killed. She was exchanged in the deal for the release of the hostages. Miss Khaled left a comfortable middle-class home to join the revolution and now identifies herself with her people in the squalid refugee camps. Whether we like it or not, the Leila Khalids of the world are forcing us to pay attention to them. If the world is ever going to learn how to deal with them, the first step is to listen to what they have to say. Deep in this camp on the outskirts of Beirut, where people live in subhuman conditions, is the headquarters of the Popular Front. It is there that Miss Khaled was brought to talk with us. You have become famous with the hijacking, infamous to some people, famous to others, a heroine or a devil. Does this give you a problem? Uh, is the cult of personality a danger in the revolution? Are you sort of a Joan of Arc now to the Palestinians? Not at all. I, I have done my duty, and it is uh, very small in comparison to our cause. So I'm doing my duty. I'm not considered neither as a heroine nor a, a Joan of Arc or anything like that, because everyone who is doing his duty, uh, he is not a hero. And this is the natural thing to do for my cause. If I want my home back, anyone wants his home back, he has to do and to struggle for it. Uh, and we have many people who are working inside the occupied land, outside, but nobody knows about them. It's uh, unfortunately I was not because, you know, there is no other way to hide me. And here we are. You could not probably be a hijacker again, could you? 
It's not the means of a hijacker. It's, I'm not specialized in hijacking. But whatever our cause needs, we will do it. And I consider myself one who is going to do whatever gives benefit to our cause. So if it will be hijacking or not, it will be something else, I will do it. Where, uh, where were you born in Palestine? In Haifa. When did you leave there? 1948. I did not leave it. I was obliged to leave it. There is, um, again, there are two stories about that. Some people say that the Arabs asked you to leave, expecting you to go back, but you think you were driven out? Yes, I don't forget in my whole life, and I want to tell it to every one of my people, and every one of my people has a story, how we left that time. I don't remember anything of Haifa, except the day we left. Two Israelis, or two Jews, uh, they came and they were having guns, and they told us to leave our, uh, our home. My mother was trying to get some clothes for us, and they didn't accept, they were standing on the uh, door, at the door of the bedroom, and at the door of the, our house. I was crying, and I was saying, I don't want to leave, because uh, they are going to take our home, they are going to take our food, they are going to take everything. And, you know, I was young. I only remember this thing. And afterwards, I don't remember the way we left, except that my mother told me that we left in a, one of the cars. And came here to Lebanon. Have you seen Haifa since? I haven't seen Haifa except from the air. So imagine yourself seeing your country just from the air. From the air, and then that was in an American airliner. It was in an Amer in a hijacked American airliner. So uh, we have to do everything so that we can go back for a hijacking. Uh, as, for example, hijacking a TWA, a hijacking of uh, an Israeli plane, uh, anything that make me the first step to see my country and afterwards to restore it. Nothing else will do? No, not at all. I don't expect that anyone in the world, the United Nations or anyone in the world, will come and say, all right, Layla and many like Layla, come and take your country back. No. It's the only way how to go back is by the revolution and the popular revolution. It's been a while now since the four hijackings and, and the unsuccessful one in which you were involved. Do you think that from your standpoint, it worked? Was it a good thing? All the people in the world, they didn't hear me while I was shouting and crying when the Israeli guns were, were behind me, obliging me to leave and not only me, all our people. They didn't hear the phantoms bombing our uh, people. They didn't hear the Nepal burning our children, our women. And uh, we have to do something for these people to understand us. But I'm surprised, really, to know that all those people, they don't know anything about us, just except when we had our guns and we had our grenades. Well, the immediate result of the hijackings was a civil war in Jordan between your people and the government. We know very well who are our enemies. They are not Israel only. It is not Israel and only the occupied land. It's Israel, the Zionist movement, the imperialist powers in the world by the leadership of the United States government and the reactionary regimes the Arab reactionary regimes. One of the Arab reactionary regimes is the regime in Jordan. And uh, they were preparing this massacre beforehand. So it is not... It would have happened anyhow. Yes, it would have happen happened, and we have proofs for it. Ms. Khaled, you say uh, your enemies are uh, Israel, the Zionist movement, the United States, the United States government. The United States government. The imperialist powers by the leadership of the United States government. And the government. reactionary Arab governments. And the reactionary. Why the United States government? Because they, uh, they consider Israel as the 52nd state. Have you ever been to the United States, Ms. Khaled? No. I can't, you know, uh, as one of the people who were driven out, 
I hadn't the opportunity to go from one place to another because I didn't have, first of all, I didn't have the money. And uh, we don't have the time for tours. So only for our missions, we go for other parts of the world. And we don't care to see the other parts of the world. I don't care. You are personally. not a tourist. No, I'm not a tourist. But I, when I go for an operation or anyone, of my people go for an operation. They seem to be tourists, but they are not. Will there be more operations? If, if we consider that uh, this kind, we consider this kind of struggle is giving benefit to our cause, we will do it, and we are doing it. So I can't say that if there is going to be hijacking or not. I don't know. You are a, a, a communist movement a Marxist-Leninist movement. Yeah. Yet you are part of a culture which is presumably anti-communist. Have you and your people turned away... Anti-communist. Anti-communist. Have you turned away from, from uh, the Muslim religion? Not yet. Not yet. But it is less important than it used to be? We don't care for uh, religion to decide our future. Because if I were a Jew or a, uh, because a Jew is a religion, a Christian or Muslim or whatever, I have the religion. It is the problem of uh, the cause itself. And I was driven out of my country, so I have to struggle back, irrespective of, of what is my religion. Now, Patrick was Christian. He died for my cause. Is it because? He, he was supporting me because I'm a Muslim. It's not so. It's from a revolutionary point of view. What would you settle for in the Middle East? We want to liberate the country at this stage. Afterwards, to establish a democratic government in Palestine where the Arab and the Jew have the same rights. Would you settle for anything less? Uh, Russia indicated it would settle for, uh, and some of the Arab governments indicated they would talk about it, for something like a restoration of territories taken in 1967. Would you we, settle for that? We don't accept it, and we have proved that we don't accept it by our uh, work. We have hijacked the planes. One of the reasons, just to break this uh, kind of settlement, to stop the negotiations of, or something like that. And we have done it now. But whenever we feel that there will be negotiations, another deeds will be done uh, inside the occupied land, outside the occupied land, I can't tell, but I can say that we are uh, in a position that we can do it. Uh, for example, as for the imperialist powers in uh, Europe, uh, the what so-called Great Britain government, uh, we have made them uh, change some of their rules because they wanted, for example, they wanted to charge me in, uh, uh, in London. They couldn't because we, we were in a, uh, power, uh, in a position of power to make them accept our demands, and they have accepted it. Uh, as for example, if, uh, not uh, for example, if, the, if that hijacking of al Al, which I share, has uh, succeeded, uh, I think we could have obliged uh, Israel government to accept our demands. How long will this struggle go on, Ms. Khaled? Do you see victory for your cause in your lifetime? No. I think it uh, will last for 20 or 30 years. This is the struggle of people. It lasts very long. So we are prepared for it. I don't think I will go back. I personally, or my generation, the second or the third generation will reach Palestine. You don't think you will see Haifa again? Maybe I will see it in our means, but not in the means of restoration and liberating it, because we believe that a popular revolution means a long time. And for people, time is with the people always, and not against it, when they use it properly. And I think we are beginning to use it here use the time properly for our cause. Nearly two years ago, 60 Minutes made the first of several trips to the Middle East. 
We reached a conclusion most reporters who have been there share, that ceasefires and talks between governments and pressures from the big powers are all somewhat irrelevant, that there can be no real peace until Israelis and Palestinians talk to each other. Leila Khaled's intransigence underlines that conclusion. We can block negotiations, she says. We have proved it, and we will prevent any peace that does not give us back our homeland. That homeland has been Israel now for 22 years, and no Israeli considers it even remotely negotiable. It is an impasse, the world's most dangerous impasse. You're entertaining your husband's family for the first time.